So hello everyone and welcome to our panel this evening. Um, we're going to be speaking about Black British writing now and the publishing industry and how it affects Black British writers and how they fit into the industry in the UK as a whole. I'm really excited to introduce our two guests this evening. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, so think of whatever you want to ask and um, we can try and get around to everyone if we can. Um, our first author um, is a twice best-selling author, a journalist and a TV presenter. Um, she recently released her second novel, which is um, Sister, Sister, and we'll be ta talking more about that this evening. And our second panelist is um, an author and the founder of Sable Lit Mag, um, as well as Afro Poetry, and we'll be talking about her book, This is the Canon. So I'd like to introduce, and I want you all to, get, to give a warm welcome to Candice Braithwaite and Khadija Sese. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, so just before we speak about publishing in the more wider sense, I want to sort of zoom in on your individual projects. And I'll start with you, Candice. Your novel, Sister, Sister, has been released. And um, if you want to just give a short description about what it is and who it's aimed at and your kind of reasons for writing it. Uh, yeah, Sister Sister notes on things I've learned the hard way so you don't have to. It's like the manual I wish I had when I was a young black girl. I came up in that very Ms. Bounty era. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you want to get the guy, pull your blonde hair into a butt, like that kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. And I found that none of the conversation took into account the black British female experience. So I was like, if I ever get the chance to write... Um, books I want to write for that young person mm -hmm. it was really strange to write it now though because I'm 33 <laughs> so it feels like I was really talking to my younger self and I was severely embarrassed at times but it, it's still a necessity because I I think books like sister sister there's still a huge gap in the market um yeah I don't want to answer any more questions I can get ahead of myself <laughs> <laughs> amazing so um so one thing about Candice's book is that it's kind of structured into almost essay-like chapters on different topics. So everything from hair to money and finance to colorism in relationships. And I just wanted to know, were there any chapters that you kind of had to leave on the cutting room floor? <laughs> and what was there anyone you had to consult in making this book? What was that process like for you? Uh, legal is always something you have to be yeah. mindful of, especially yeah. when you're dealing with non-fiction, especially someone like me. I like my money where I can see it. And if you talk about people in the wrong way, they can come for your change. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not down for that. So there's a lot that was left on the cutting room floor. Um, and in a way, actually, what was left on the cutting room floor was really, really helpful. I say in the book, silence can never be misquoted. And mm -hmm. it's sometimes one of the most potent forms of rebuttal, not saying anything, because also... I don't want to give people 20,000 words if you've pissed me off. Mm. I actually want you to feel like you're not worth it. So there is a chapter in there that is just five words. Mm -hmm. And it's the most talked about chapter because it's like, girl, <laughs> what are we on chapter four already? Moving on. Um, but sometimes that's how it has to be. And so I did consult. I always consult my husband mm. because my stories are a reflection of him at this point. And my granddad. Other than that, you just throw it at the wall and see what sticks, mm. to be fair. Amazing. Um, and so for you, Khadija, I'd love for you to also just talk about your book. And um, I'd love to kind of know what the journey of your book as well, because I can imagine a lot of research went into it and a lot of kind of selecting of different texts and different books that you wanted to include and some you had to leave out as well. I'd love to know what that process was. Yeah, Um before I say that, can I just say about Candice's book? Sorry. The first chapter is the essential one for black women. I don't even have to say what it is, right? It's on hair. I mean, yeah, so I thought, okay, I'm down with this book. And get it together. It's essential. So we had World Afro Hair Day on like the 15th yeah. of the month. So yeah, that's all really important. Um, yeah, the book I've been working on is called This is the Canon. And there were three authors, so we all in it equally. So the other two authors are Deirdre Osborne and uh, I should say Dr. Deirdre Osborne and Professor Joan Animado. Mm -hmm. And especially for Joan, 
um, being a professor, because we know there's hardly any black professors in the country, and very few black ones. She's now just retired um, but from Goldsmiths University. So there's the three of us who put the book together, and basically it's, this is the canon, um, decolonizing your bookshelf in 50 books. So there's a selection of 50 books that we are saying, we know that there is this standard canon, but we're gonna break that. <laughs> and this is the ones that you're now going to weave in. We're not saying it's gonna replace, but these are going to weave into what you already have. And there's not even only those 50 books. There could have been, we could have selected another 50 books. It was so challenging. And we've probably left out names and people are going to say, how come that person wasn't in it? And how come that person wasn't? But we couldn't, there were just so many mm. we could have included. And it was from like the Second World War up to the current. And we just need to give people a breadth of work from non-white non authors. So it was kind of like a, from Africa, Asia, from the Caribbean. You know, so, and from an especially indigenous people, particularly like from the Australias and from the North America side. So they all had to be included as well. So yeah, um, but actually I think my favorite section anyway, apart from those 50 authors, we actually did another section called, well, if you like this, try this. And then we just tried to stuff as many other people yeah. <laughs> into that section as well, because there were so many good writers mm -hmm. now. And we didn't necessarily put them all in those sections under race um, or under gender. We did them also under theme or any little kind of thing we thought, well, if people were interested in that, they could read this mm -hmm. because it's reflecting the same thing, just so that people could come and try and discover new things in, in new ways as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I will say I've managed to look at a copy of the book. It's being released in October. And what you'll want to do when you buy it and read it is open up any kind of wish list you have, whether it's on Goodreads or Amazon or whatever, and just write down everything because there are so many good recommendations in there that you will not have heard of that you, you'll you want to read and buy. And that's a nice kind of segue into the next question, which is about discovery. Um, both of your books are great vehicles for discovery in some sense. And I feel like for you, Candies, I felt such a good sense of, I can take this and I can share it with other young black women or girls or boys even, but also yeah, it invites, definitely boys. yeah, <laughs> especially boys. Yeah. Um, but it also invites kind of for non-black readers to sort of have a look at the black female experience. Mm. Um, and for you, Khadija, there's a sense of discovery in quite a very obvious sense of these are texts that you may not have heard of that you should have heard of and should be canonized. Um, I wanted to kind of ask both of you, for a lot of non-black readers who might be kind of coming across your work, was that ever a consideration for you in writing these books? And how did that kind of affect how you formed your book and the work that went into it, knowing that non-black people could read this and essentially not know what you're talking about or not have been familiar with these things? Yeah, never, never, never. Um it, it it became violently important to me to write from the perspective of being a black woman and not holding in mind the white gaze. The reality is J.K. Rowling does not hold me in mind. Enid Blyton never held me in mind. And it would have been detrimental. And it would have been me cursing myself, mm -hmm. being like... And this is the thing. Before I met the wonderful Quercus... Um, a version of Sister Sister was turned down no less than nine times by various houses mm. because it wasn't a universal conversation. Mm. This is cute, but could you make this more universal? This is cute, but could you insert white women here? And it's just like, no, I don't feel like doing this. This was in a pre-BLM era, though, mm. where they were like, there is no market for this material. Post-BLM, everyone wants a slice of the pie, obviously. And so I think that just made me dig my heels in more. Also, with I'm Not Your Baby Mother, there was almost a glossary. Like, I lost my mind for a bit. And I was in my group chat like, yo, I'm saying some words. Should I put an asterisk <laughs> and then a glossary so people know what mandem is and rare tear tear? And all my girls were like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever gave us a glossary. We are not yeah. giving them a glossary. Yeah. Like, if it means that much to you, you will just go and Google. So that's not to say that I never felt the pressure. I just had to stand firm and be like, also... Um, 
me doing that meant that it diluted the black British experience because the reality is the harder parts of our lives, you're never giving us mercy. You're never giving us a glossary. You're never giving us a margin for error. So I'm not about to invite you into my world and be like, everyone usually has to take their shoes off, but you can just, no, 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 you know? So no, never. (laughs) Amazing. Mm. Uh, And what about you, Khadija? Well, I think because of the type of book it is, we are aiming for, we are trying to say to um, a non-black audience, you need to be, if you think that you're well-read, check this. Mm -hmm. And are you now so well-read? Number one. Number two, but it is also for black people as well, because we are finding that so many of them have not heard of the writers that they should know about. And that's kind of sad, which, which kind of tells you not only about the education in this country, but maybe the education in their own countries, mm. and that it's still so anglicized or still so colonized in that they're not given authors from their own countries even. Mm. So we, you'll still find that you know the book had to go both ways. So we had to be, you know, in, in terms of thinking about that as we were doing it, but also there was no watering down. We tried not to water down as much as possible because at the end of the day, as we were doing the book, the decolonization isn't just about the book list. That's, mm. that's, it's almost like the first step. And it was a very painful first step. <laughs> it's almost like the first step because decolonization within that has to come as how do you read? How do you read about the books? How do you write about the books? How, you know, how do you come to it through the reading? And we needed to kind of present it in a way that this is how the author has written it. So, you know, we would have some challenges when it was being edited because we'd have to go, no, 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 no. That has to stay the way it is, Mm. you know. Um, You cannot take out that character that we've written about because that character is essential in terms of the culture of the time. So there is that whole essence of having to have those challenges all along the way. So there is no way we could kind of water it down anymore Mm. because then we're not doing justice to the writers that we are writing about. Mm. And especially since some of us, I mean, some of the writers have now passed in there, mm. but a lot of them are alive and we know them. So if we, <laughs> there's no way we can mess around. And we, and we yeah. teach them or we read them. And, and, you know, and I teach more in terms of around creative writing, but part of that is having people to read. Mm. So whether it's in the classroom as studying or part of your creative writing, I'm encouraging people to read these writers. So I have to you know, present them in in the most honest way that they, in the most authentic way that they want to be presented, mm-hmm. you know? Definitely, and there's definitely some similarities with both of your approaches in authenticity. Mm. Um, I'd like to kind of circle back to the wider theme of publishing and black British writers in publishing. And I want to know what your, your own separate experiences in the publishing um, process of your books have been. And... I'd also, if possible, like to hear how, if you can, compare that to any of your non-black slash non-female peers, whether you saw any clear differences in how your publishing slash editing process went versus how you'd have heard your peers who aren't black or who aren't female to have gone. I'll start with you, (laughs) Candice. Oh, child. (laughs) Um... Very different. Interestingly, I used to work in publishing. I used to work for a very big publishing house and I worked in the marketing department. So I've come into writing from a very different angle and maybe like with insider tips and tricks. And what I noticed years before we had the term influencer is that many publishing houses were solely going after people with large platforms Mm -hmm. because publishing is a business and it started to dilute the authenticity or the hard work that comes along with writing. It's like, oh, you've got a million followers. Would you like to write a book? Because we know we're going to sell at least 5%, yada, yada, yada. And being somewhat, uh, people would say, uh, as a part-time influencer myself, I think that was the surrounding expectation. And I tried, like, I really doubled down on being like, no, I can really write. You not just do this for bants, Mm. but, like, if we had to go toe-to-toe, you'd have to show me your ghostwriter because you cannot outwrite me in this lifetime. And that meant that... um, I had to be steadfast in the kind of work I wanted to do because I'm sure there's many houses that would have just given me a ghostwriter and slapped a sticker on it. But I also found that there were just more challenges. Again, before I found Quercus, it was always your platform's not big enough yet. Mm. It was never your writing's not good Mm. enough. 
It was never we don't like the story. It was never you can't write. Go and get a, a bigger platform and then maybe we'll look into it. Whereas my white counterparts, male and female, can fart onto a book. Quite literally <laughs> fart. <laughs> And they will slap a sales <laughs> sticker on that and be like, th the reality is that the bar is still higher for us. We still have to, our arms ache from ever stretching mm -hmm. to meet this in this I, this invisible barrier of like, you have to be that level of excellence. And don't get me started, and I know our community doesn't like to hear this, don't get me started on how we judge each other mm -hmm. because of that. Because of the framework of white supremacy, all of us black writers were quick to be like, oh, I didn't even think that was that good. Mm. Mm. Like, so nitpicky. When it's like our white counterparts can write ABC and you've, they've got all their buddies down at their launch party. Oh, best mm. thing I've ever written. Uh. And it's just like, it's so tiring. Mm. So um, I could go on and on. I just found it really, really difficult. And it's so strange. Two books in, I still do. Mm. And I still find it almost heartbreaking to know that I don't think this country's even begun to scratch the surface of the black writing talent in this country. It's just that publishing is still that old guard. It's still pale male and stale. It's still, you need nepotism to get in the door, not necessarily talent. And so, yeah, let me not take off the whole chat <laughs> <laughs> with my annoyance. <laughs> and what about you, Khadija? Well, I'd just like to pick up on something you said, which is really, really pertinent, because I work with, a lot of my work is working with black and Asian writers. So I would just mm. say black, because I come from the time where, as far as I'm concerned, black and Asian, we're all black, because we're still in the struggle. Mm. I don't know why people think that that struggle is over. It is not over. Mm. So, you know, and I will be talking to Asian writers up in, in Leeds or something in my generation, and they're like, well, I'm black, because I'm still in the struggle. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So... I'm coming kind of from that, and so I work with professional development, trying to nurture writers, particularly outside of London. Mm. So this is the thing. So when we're talking about scratching the talent, mm. you hardly any of the writers outside of London are getting in because it's so the publishing is so London centric, you know. And when I was trying to, I've just been working on an anthology with um, an editor, Le Leonie Ross, who is great. Her novels coming up, but she's also a great editor. And we really try and reach out to areas where we haven't had writers come through. One of those areas is Liverpool. Now, Liverpool is one of the oldest black communities in this country. Would you believe I could find one black woman writer who'd published a novel and she's like 70? Mm. What's, what's going on? Mm. You know, so I know this isn't that the regional thing isn't just a black thing, but that's not my concern, <laughs> to be honest. Mm. But I'm thinking, where are these stories? Where are these regional stories? Mm. You know, they, they are there. And, you know, so in terms of, so now I'll get back to the other bit of your question, sorry. But I had to say that because it's so important yeah. that the, those writers get left out. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing was, when I moved to Leeds to go and work with those writers, people thought that something had happened to me. They thought I'd had a breakdown and that I was going to Leeds to <laughs> kind of recover. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. It's just like, what is this? You know, <laughs> it's, it's really ridiculous. But one of the largest publishers of Caribbean writers, they're in Leeds. It's People Tree Press, you know. So, so that's where they are. But I've worked with the large publishers and independents, more smaller independents. There's challenges with both. But I will often say to emerging writers, please look at the smaller independent writers as well. I mean, it's all about the relationship. And that relationship takes a long time to build. So like Candace was saying, it's two big books in. Mm. Look at Bernadine Evaristo, and she's talking to people, 20 years, mm -hmm. 20 years, you know, and that is normal. That is normal. Two of my friends have just been published last year. Again, that was a 20 year journey. It, sometimes it takes that long. And it's, that sometimes it takes that long because there's just no support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you need constant support. And when there were black writing programs, it was like three years, Okay, funding's ended. Who get who writes a novel in three years? Mm. So it, sometimes you can, you know. Sometimes that's where lockdown <laughs> helped. <laughs> sometimes you can, but a lot of time it's a lot of nurturing and a lot of support because the black writers absolutely have no confidence. Mm. They have, they've been given no confidence, so you are always there. And I've been working with some of the writers. I've been working with for ten years. They're just getting to that book. You can't take that away from them and say, "Well, look, you, your time's up." Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'd love to kind of expand on that point a bit because part of what I want to unpack is where is it all going wrong? What is the issue with um, why aren't black writers getting what they need from publishing and from publishing houses? 
Um, do you have any insights on that? Do you have any? I know Candice has spoken to you previously, mm. and you spoke about um, not having enough black people in these publishing houses, not having enough black editors and people who really understand what the material they're working with. I'd love to know from both of your points of view, what where are black writers being underserved? I will add to that of um, them there not being enough editors. There's also then so few that the ones that are in that space feel they need to beef each other. Mm. I remember when working in publishing, like the two other black women in that same space, always had an attitude and I, I empathise with that attitude because we're sold as each other's competition and so maybe you don't want to pitch the next new hottest young black writer you've come across because you know at any moment you could be out of a job mm -hmm. so now you march to their tune mm -hmm. so it is about like injecting huge numbers w when it comes to black people within the publishing industry so it doesn't feel like a one and done diversity tick box exercise because whether that person within that space knows it or not again that white supremacy thinking will chip away at your confidence mm -hmm. and and you won't feel like you can stand up for the black writers that you know. Mm. So I do think that needs to happen. I came into publishing via something called The Scheme, which um, was really strange, actually. But you didn't need a degree. That was the most important thing for me. I weren't going to uni for no one. So I'm like, how do I get into this without that? Mm. And that needs to happen. Publishing needs to understand, especially post-COVID, this whole uni thing is not going to fly for a lot of people in this country. Is that really still the bar? Is Oxford and Cambridge really still the bar to say you can find good talent or you're a good editor? So I think um, the requirements for gaining entry into this space also need to change. And again, you know I love a laugh girl, but people just need to die. Like, older people just need to... <laughs> it, it, because it's just, it's just like... Nepo it's continued nepotism. Yeah. It's one <laughs> guy who's like 80, who's like, oh, well, my friend's friend's son needs a job. You yeah. know, it's that on rotation. Yeah. And I'm like, when, once we can get rid of the old guard, be that by retirement or death, whatever, we can then <coughs> allow people with different ideas and broader thinking to grow because also we're not just inviting a different race we're inviting different classes mm -hmm. once we understand that we're opening up to more black people mm -hmm. and that really is where you see the difference because so much of this writing you get variety when you open your eyes to different classes not just race mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely and what are your thoughts Khadija? Yeah, I think, you know, it's all very well that the larger publishing houses are having these intern schemes or training schemes, but putting one person, mm -hmm. one sole black person in that space is not very helpful. Mm -hmm. They have got no support. They, ne they need support. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to put a group of them in that one space, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you yeah, know, they sometimes all big themselves up when it comes to a, a conference time or under book fair or something, but, you know, it, it, it needs more than that. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the schemes I've worked with um, young interns on, it's um, it's from like Leicester University, and they do this transcultural publishing model. And so the only publishers they work with are small black and Asian publishers. Mm -hmm. They're not all of the interns are black. A lot of them are, are non-black. A lot of them are white from other places. But what that says to me is when they start going into the publishing industry, they will have more knowledge than some other people in there about what it's like to work with a smaller black publishing mm -hmm. house. So we also need that as well, because we know we're not gonna have, obviously be able to have the whole, you know, we're not gonna get mm -hmm. exactly, in terms of percentage wise, black people in the publishing industry. But so you need to have some of the, like, the younger people coming in saying, well, actually we need to think differently around this. Mm -hmm. We need that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because I know I kind of, when I think about it, it's only now, because now there is a, a group, a small group, black um, agents and editors. Oh my gosh, there's about 40 of us. This is incredible. You know, I had to say maybe about eight years ago, you could count the black editors on one hand. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, there was, there was nothing there. There were, hard, there were hardly any. So all of this has got to change. And for me, the main thing is we need a variety of publishers. So yes, you need the major publishers. We need more black publishers. That's my thing more black publishers um, and I'm not saying that is the answer but we do need more of them mm. because that again we come to with that understanding but again I'm also it's about ownership mm. yeah we we need to 
the only yeah. one. Um, I'm sure you both, I'm sure everyone noticed that off the back of the um, George Floyd murder back in 2020, um, there was kind of this global recognition of how different industries were almost underserving mostly black um, you know people from all all walks of life and I wanted to get your point of view on whether or not those protests changed anything um, within publishing for the better or whether that was kind of a, enough of a change for you did you notice a shift in in how publishing was being conducted and was it a good enough shift in your point of view? Oh, yes and no, because we always need to remember that there's a the backdrop is an innocent man's murder. So mm. that that is why we're here, right? There was this part of me that was like, yes, it's so good to see these black authors finally getting the recognition they deserve. And uh, there was like this sick kiddie part of me that was like, I love seeing all these new authors getting snapped up. Even if you know that um, publishers have reached out and be like, I have this idea that I need you to front because you're the, I'm like, sis, get the coin because <laughs> it's been a long time coming. But I do fear that the backlash will just be then black writers not being happy about the work they've created, say in five, 10 years time, because it has seemed like a quick come up. Like we need all these black mm -hmm. authors to make it seem like we're doing the work. Mm -hmm. It's such a, a double-edged sword. I just think, um, again, there's so many writers who wouldn't have got the praise they rightfully deserve if that moment didn't happen. But it's like, how do we, like Khadija was saying, how do we grow that? How do we harness that? How do we make sure that they have the support? Because that's another thing. When things don't go well for a black writer, watch out. Mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. Hung out to dry is like an understatement. So where's the support for when a book flops? Where's the support in, again, getting the right editors that can ensure that the, the white reader feels comforted if that's the vibe they want, but also that the black person's voice isn't diluted. I think that there was such haste especially to publish literature that was very heavy on, this is what you can do, this is how you can mm. unlearn. This is, I'm just like, is this really resonating? Or is it like everyone can see money in this? The reality is the publisher looks good on both sides. Mm. We're doing our thing for these poor black people and we're making a lot of money. Mm. It's like, no, where, uh, where are the black authors you supported before a moment mm. like George, you know? Yeah, what do you think? I just totally agree with everything you yeah. said. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that much more to add, but um, I don't think it is enough. I'm just waiting because it's like just been a little bit of more than a year and things mm -hmm. do go in those three a year rotations. Wait for the third year. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay very well giving some money to some black groups. Oh yeah, we really understand where you're coming from. We're supporting you. How much are you giving the following year? Mm -hmm. How much are you giving the year after that? And are you going to stop in year three? Is this a continual thing? Colonialism was was going on for how many how many decades? Mm. Okay, it's not going to stop with your three year funding. Mm. You know, and that is for publishers. That is for universities. Mm. That is for so many different industries. Mm. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a long journey. That's why I'm saying the struggle is still continuing. You know, and actually now you need to st it's stepping up. It needs to be made more aware. It's changed slightly. And I, I must say, I went on one of the marches um, because I belong to this group called United F uh, Family and Friends Campaign for people who they've had somebody who's died in police custody. And some of us went up there. We were so energized with what we saw the young people doing. It actually made us, the old ones, feel like, well, okay, we're leaving it in safer hands because there's a lot of young people from all different races who are all supporting each other. We thought, if this energy really can just continue, mm. it will be great. Mm. You know, and they will actually be doing more than those people sitting on the seats giving money. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's what we, we need to have more of, and that's what we need we need to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to know because I'm not sure if there are any writers in the audience, but do you? I'd imagine there are some black writers who just want to write a book, you know, like a love story, a, a normal love story, and others want to write about witches and warlocks. Do you think that? at the moment with the appetite that publishers seem to have for content about unlearning racism or speaking about those issues that affect us, do you think there is a danger of it coming across like that's the only story that they want to see told? Is that the impression you get from publishing houses? 
definitely. I can't remember. Unless I specifically went to WH Smith as a preteen and looked at the black aisle that had like the uh, um like Fly Girl by Omar Tyree or was it Zane or like th- like just normal love stories that weren't always about race like that wasn't the the the, the umbrella. I can't remember when last you know you've just read a love story like that. They're so few and far between and it would I right now the current trend would put a black writer off I could see that when they just want to write about love or magic or whatever I would say don't um don't turn away from what your mind and heart wants to do because I believe there will always be a time and like with all trends there'll be a backlash like Y2K is back can you believe that <laughs> like I'm just like did we not shave our eyebrows off and regret like how can you be bringing this back so there will be a moment when and this is the fact, even though we are burdened with the reality of being black, there'll come a time they'll get sick of reading it. <laughs> and then then what? And that's when the love stories and, and other things, normal day-to-day things, mm. universal experiences, fiction, fantasy, all of that will come into play. But I do think right now it does feel very heavy on the activism, mm. unlearn, teach and that is what worries me how long are you going to expect the oppressed to teach you know what not to do how many books do you need to unlearn your racism how many books do you need to understand that if you were born with that skin you have inherent privilege I don't want to hear your yada yada till the end of time and it's unfair that these talented writers these talented black writers feel so damn pigeonholed it's like I won't get a deal unless I concede to this idea that I can be your your teacher and take on this emotional labor Mm -hmm. absolutely what do you think Khadija yeah, I think that whole heavy, you know, the single story thing is, is still there. Um, and, and I think Chimamanda's um, uh, TEDx about that mm. is, is really good. That whole single story thing is earlier. And yes, sometimes it changes with what is the change that has gone on with the world. But I think Black World is becoming bolder. Mm. I think now as well, you know, in this country used to be, in terms of compared to America, used to be much more snobby with their publishing. And so if you were self-published, it was like vanity publishing. We're not touching it at all. Whereas in America, they'd kind of look at it and say, okay, that person's done this stuff themselves. Mm. So we can go and now sell it in other states and make more money. They wouldn't think about that here. It's like, it's self-published. It's got to be terrible. Whereas now a lot of black writers are just ignoring that and going ahead and publishing, whether it might be just with Amazon or online or whatever, they're publishing themselves. They're not waiting so much anymore. They, they're just going ahead and doing their stuff. And, and I think, you know, I think that is important as well. We've got to kind of show and break those boundaries that, that we're not going to wait. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we are in for still the longer haul of having to show those others around um, how long, how much longer do we have to teach you <laughs> kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I know you had a phrase in your introduction, something like you're uncom- something about you have to live with your uncomfortability. Yeah. Get, get, get comfortable, comfortable being uncomfortable. Get comfortable yeah. being uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, and they're not doing that yet. Instead of <laughs> and instead of doing that, we kind of get these things like, oh, poor me. <laughs> I'm not interested in your poor you. <laughs> we, you know, we've, been, we've had our poor you for how many years? <laughs> you know? Um, so now you get to know what it's the poor me. But yeah, get, get comfortable with your that uncomfortability because that, that is going to have to, that is going to go on for a long time mm. because they should, people should know, but they don't. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if they do, some, there's, there's some misconnection somewhere, but they, but they, they don't know. And, um, and you, you kind of have to say, what should I do? Should I laugh or should I cry? Mm. Or should I just really do, just really calm down about it and just do some more explanation? And um, the way I come from it, I just think to myself, if it's going to take some more explanation, I'm going to do it because otherwise it's just going to be an ex- excuse. Well, I asked and I wasn't told, so that's why I'm still doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it is kind of like a like a, a baby with a with a security blanket. You know, their security blanket is their not knowing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I also wanted to touch on kind of what some what could hold some writers back from writing that book, from seeking representation, or whatever needs to happen. And um, Candy, she spoke earlier about sometimes how support can be lacking within the community as well. Mm. And I wonder if there's something in that of that pressure of almost having to represent the black experience with your one voice Mm. 
and being treated like a monolith almost within within publishing and and with the books that sort of get shared and marketed and is there something in that of that pressure to represent the black experience whatever that is yeah the black experience in accordance with what's selling right now Mm -hmm. definitely I don't think that's like like from a personal standpoint I'm a big TikTok fan and Gen Z do not care about your your linear thinking of what the black experience is Mm -hmm. I come across all goths and all these other wonderful people that I'm I'm I'm, I never get to meet day to day but I do think in a literary sense yeah there is still that and I just do you know what though you didn't ask me this but I will insert this as well in our ge- you're a millennial right mm. so in our generation specifically also there is just no patience also mm. like we were just saying Bernadine Evaristo 20 years and millennials don't have 20 years <laughs> so they think we ain't got no 20 years you want to you want to bang it today <laughs> because everywhere you look it's Forbes 30 under 30 yeah. and Dave's yeah. like 12 and you're <laughs> all your peers are two and they've won a Grammy and you're just so like oh my gosh everyone's doing better than me and I just I think that makes um the work uh we can end up creating uh, quite microwavable content and it's not really well thought out because we just want that that hitter as an example don't watch the title no actually watch the title because the title is as important as the book Keisha the Sket is back yeah I don't know if people would know that book but it's just like Keisha the Sket was a story that began on MSN when I was in like year eight and that has now been picked up by Murky and that just goes to show that a story that resonates will stand the test of time (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um Jade LB, her work is now being carried along in a time where she can get her flowers. Mm. But I think um, one of the things that hold us back, and again, no one really wants to hear it or say it, is it's just like, well, I want to pop now. And I don't understand why I need to graft, um, to graft at crafting this over five, even 10 years. Mm. That doesn't make sense to me when it feels like everyone around me is winning. Um, and it doesn't count for everyone because everyone's experience is different, including my own. But we can go back to what Michaela Cole said the other day, like, don't be afraid to go away. Don't be afraid to unplug or not be liked. If that, if you can do that, I think there needs to be like an, an asterisk that says that some people's lives aren't in that place right now. And some people use the internet to pay their bills and that should be looked at in a separate column. But outside of that, don't be afraid to lock yourself away. So much magic can happen from just being the seer and you can't be seen and the seer at the same time. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I've tried mm-hmm. and it doesn't work. Like you lose out, you like step back from your peers, step back and see what they're doing so you can write about it from an authentic place and know that if the work is good enough and I don't mean this in a sense of black people having to work twice as hard if the work is good enough to you because the reality is you have to learn to write for an audience of one as soon as you start to think about all the people that could come across your work you fumbled the bag Mm -hmm. because now you're going to be trying to write with well what if that person as soon as your work is good enough to to you you have to trust that the universe, I'm into my woo-woo, sorry, the universe is going to meet that work at the right time Mm. and give you what you deserve. Mm. I love that. Um, And for you, Khadija, especially this is the canon kind of explores so many different narratives, so many different Mm. stories from coming of age to, you know, there are some trauma stories in there as there should be because that is part of so many people's experiences. I'd love your input on that as well as someone who's kind of explored all of these topics. So just in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was the <laughs> just in terms of this um, pressure that some writers may have to kind of encapsulate what the black experience, quote unquote, is, and how that can kind of stop the next, you know, book turn a pri- book a turn a prize. I was going to say book a prize winning um, person from writing that novel. Mm. Yeah, it, sh- it shouldn't have to stop them. I think um, what is... Um, what was I going to say now? What was interesting? I think um, what is interesting, because you will have writers, you know, approaching it from, you know, their work from different ways. And when they get to a certain point, they'll kind of say, well, I'm writing for me. Because you get you get some standard questions maybe from, from the audience, and one of them tends to be, so, you know, who, 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 uh, who was your, uh, you know... 
who is your inspiration kind of thing and and are you writing just for you kind of thing and you'll have writers saying well I'm writing for me I'm writing for me first I don't have to write for anybody else mm. I don't have to be a a, um, a role model mm. unfortunately you do <laughs> whether you like it or not you are a role model there anyway you are that writer who's in the audience who wants to be able to reach what you have done they are looking at you and seeing how you've done it and how long it's taken you to get there and everything so unfortunately whether you want to be a role model or not I think, you know, you don't have to go all out to say, I'm a role model. Mm -hmm. Just the very fact that you've done it, you're kind of like a role model. So it's going to take different writers, you know, different amounts of time to get there. And they're all going to reflect in different ways. And sometimes, you know, you might have seen somebody's journey and you'll think, well, you know, I knew that person from X time and they've really taken a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. But I'm really pleased for them now. And, and like, for example, this has happened to me. And like, so you go up there and you want to get your book signed. <laughs> and they're just like, they're just the most unhappiest person ever. <laughs> and I just kind of think to myself, oh my gosh. And I've just admired this person for so long. And it really then sets the writer back. It sets back, but you know, they don't, you know, but they're their own person. You know, they're not going to be up, they're not going to, can't be upbeat all the time. But you, as the, the reader coming up to them, doesn't know that. So that's why I'm saying whether they, whether writers like it or not, they always, and not only writers, but maybe other like you know well-known people, they're always on their guard about being um, a role model because there's that one person. They will not know them, but they will be there that one day and catch you in your off moment. Mm -hmm. And in that off moment, you can turn them on or turn them off. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it, it's, it's tough, really. And I think it's, it's really tough at the moment on, on black writers and everything because we are in that space where we've had to graft, we've had to graft a lot to get there. So it's like, how much of yourself do you give out? Mm -hmm. You know, because you've got to keep some stuff for yourself to be able to do that mm -hmm. next book and everything, you know. So um, I, there's a friend of mine on, on Twitter. I think Twitter is a really good space for people who like in terms of writers and there's a writer called Mukoma Wangugi who's in New York and he said something like well for black writers when we, when you see us getting there it's because we've done it ourselves because we have to do it ourselves because nobody's doing it for us and that that's what it's like mm. yeah um so just before I open it up to the audience I just have one more question and it's just that what are some books that you've read as an adult that you wish you'd read as a teenager or child? And if you can't think of a specific book, just kinds of narratives, or I know you mentioned Candies, that your book would have been great to have read mm. when <laughs> you were young, Candies. <laughs> so maybe that's your answer. But <laughs> what are some books you've read as an adult? Uh, that's a really good question. That I'd love to have read as a... I think it's the reverse. Um, one of my favourite books is by an author called Sister Soldier. She wrote an absolute smash called The Coldest Winter Ever. And it became like a cult classic at school and it was being passed around when I was like 13, 14. And I reread it with 32-year-old eyes last year. And I was just like, Jesus, get the holy water for my eyes. Like, <laughs> in what land was this ever acceptable for a 13, 14-year-old to be reading? So... But with that said, I think in saying that, that again shows the massive hole in literature for young black British mm. preteens and teens because you were just met with that coldest winter type energy. There was no in between. Mm. Like YA seriously weren't thinking about you back then. So just like the world around you, especially for young female black readers, you were trained to see yourself as hypersexualized or angry or not beautiful, or not deserving, because you were pushed headfirst into these adult stories. So again, sorry, wrong answer. Mm, but I think right it's answer. more the reverse yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Khadija? Uh, well, for me, I think, and it's kind of encapsulating probably everything that you said, <laughs> even though I haven't read the Sister Soldier book, I yeah. kind of know about it. It's um, Ain't I a Woman by Bell Hooks. Mm. Mm. Whew. Do you know? <laughs> it's like I read it at a certain age and I thought, why couldn't I if I had this when I was a teenager? But I might not have understood it so much when I was a teenager. Yeah. True. You know? Um, who For knows? saying that, not to cut you, All About Love by Bell Hooks. Mm. 
Uh-huh. Reading that now, I was like, okay, so where was this yeah. when I was following, like, chasing trifling men on roads? <laughs> 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 You could have got this to me a little earlier. But would I have been in a place would to understand? Understand and accept. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. 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 There's some great points. <laughs> I didn't answer my question, but... <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so um, before I do open it up, just to let you guys know, before I forget, that Candice will be signing books. Um, her book, not just <laughs> random books, but like... <laughs> <laughs> um, at the Waterstones desk, if you go down the stairs, yes. it's escalators. Um, you'll see it, you won't miss it, but she will be signing her copy of Sister, Sister. Um, I'd like to open it up. If anyone does have any questions, could we go to... Um, thank you so much for your um, talk. I really enjoyed it. It's Charlie Candice. I've been a fan of you <laughs> since when I read your article on the Evening Standards just after yeah. um, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. It really touched me a lot because I had a traumatic experience in 2019 where I was racially profiled. Mm. And I'm thinking of writing a book about my experience. So I just wanted to know if there's anything, any advice you can give. Yeah. And also, Khadija, so you're also great. I don't know much about you, but, you know, hearing what you do is very good. I think you should keep the good work up, inspiring other writers outside of London, because then you share the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And it's more diverse when you hear different people's experiences, because not everyone experiences the same. So thank you for all your talking today. Thanks. Uh, my advice would be get a really good agent. Get a really good literary agent. That is literally 80% of the battle, and it's not spoken about enough, especially not to black writers. I think we toil for so long by ourselves, not understanding. And I'm going to go the extra mile here and say, get a really good white literary agent who is able to scale walls that you shouldn't have to at this point. You should be focusing on your craft. They're not all brilliant, but there are some white literary agents who will be respectful and understanding about your experience enough to not step in and and edit your voice out of the process. And because publishing still is what it is, if you want to go down the old school route of having a big house behind you, you need to find someone that speaks their language. So alongside writing from your favourite authors, like send them a DM. Writers are really personable online as well. Find out who their literary agents are because that relationship between your agent, um, they will have cultivated great relationships with houses that they believe will be the best fit to you. And that's not information black writers are privy to. We are still here writing in our journals and publishing things on Blogger which is cute and necessary, but we're not encouraged to understand the business and understand that sometimes you have to fight fire with fire, and this is still a very traditionally racist space, and sometimes you're going to need someone to use their white privilege in your honour and defence, and that's what your agent is going to do, and they take 20% of what you get, so it ain't for free, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. (laughs) Can Can I add something to that? Um, so you don't get frustrated about finding the agent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> there are organisations, and, and this is where we're a bit better than the States because a lot of their things come through creative writing programmes that you have mm. to pay a lot of money for. We have community writing organisations that are very good and very in touch with people. Things like Spread the Word in South London. Um, and that's very a fiction based, but they, you know, and they will have, you can go for sessions, you can book an appointment session to get advice and everything like that. So, you know, look online, things like spread the word are very good if you're London based, but they have them in, un- in other parts of the country, um, New Writing South, Down South, and things like that. And then if you kind of tell them, well, this is where you're at, how can they help you? Then they will, they will give you s- some advice because the, yeah, more and more in this country, you've got to look for an agent, mm-hmm. which never always used to be the case. But even that can be daunting and yes. it, can, it can be daunting in itself. But don't give up. That's the main thing. Mm. Mm. Um, I'd add to that, um, if you don't already follow him, but the author, Nikesh Shukla, mm. he has a, an amazing newsletter that he sends out for aspiring writers that gives loads of tips. And he touches on things like agents and mm. just following him on Twitter is really useful because he always has. Um, it's just if you go on Twitter and just type Nikesh Shukla, so N I K E S H S H U K L A, 
and you'll like, find it. And like Natasha said, I mean, just for people who are writers and for readers, follow mm. follow your writers, mm. your favourite writers on, yeah. on Twitter. They, you know, they have some really good conversations. Mm. I think why some of us prefer prefer Twitter. They're not talking about <laughs> what they had for breakfast. <laughs> not really. Yeah. They're talking about some serious writerly <laughs> stuff. They have writer conversations um, yeah. and industry conversations as well. So yeah, really yeah. useful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, we've got another question just here in the second row. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It's really insightful to hear your stories. Um, I had a two-part question about copywriting and publishing. I was informed that um, when I write something, I need to post it to myself mm. for it to be copyrighted. So I wanted to double check with you both if that was the case. And with publishing, um, when you were first starting out, did you use a scattergun approach in terms of you know, um, looking up all different publishing houses, small and large ones, or did you really focus on ones who were able to really share your stories? I can't answer the copyright question, so I'll go to the second one. I'm still scattergun <laughs> in my approach. Uh, it's very dangerous in my life. Um, but also, interestingly, again, love Quercus. Um, just before I found them, I was this close to self-publishing. When I say this close, I had the contract in my hand with um, people that were going to help me self-publish. I was just uh, that exhausted. And then um, uh, by... The, the grace of the universe, I met Quercus and things went a very different way. So I would say that's really exhausting, so don't do that. I say all of that to be, like, don't be scattergun. The kind of stories you want to write, find out who's publishing them. Exactly. Because then they're more likely to publish you. And it's not always the, the biggest... <laughs> The smaller, the better with publishing houses, if I can be honest. Like, really, the smaller, the better. You're going to get the attention that you need as a new writer. Bigger houses, it's dependent upon the imprint, but you can just get lost in the source, especially if you're not as big. Imagine if Chimamanda's got a book coming out. That, hey, child, uh -huh. you're done. Like, do you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? No offence. Yeah. So you need to be in a space <laughs> where people are able to lift you up. So really think about that. I mean, a really good example of that is I knew um, Bill Clinton's, um, <laughs> his, um, he had a personal diarist. He was the first president to have a personal diarist. She was a black woman. She was a journalist from his, from Arkansas. She was bringing out her book about the same time as Hillary Clinton was bringing out hers. Still gone. Mm. Yeah. She had to self-publish. But then she started up her own publishing company from that, mm. which she may not have done otherwise. So mm. that's really the, th definitely the thing. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the copywriting, that's a very that's just a very simple form of copywriting that is suggested. Mm. If you want to do it, you know you can do it. So basically, you put it in a sealed envelope and you mail it back to yourself and you mail it back to yourself. But do not open the envelope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Recognize it when it comes back that that's your copyrighted envelope. <laughs> <laughs> and you do not open it. Why is that? Why can't you open it? <laughs> because then that's this no longer copyrighted, is it? Right. It's kind of like now, because um, basically you're kind of saying what's in here is. Um, it, it's kind of sealed to say mm. that was original. Mm. Okay. And so the only way you can determine if it's original is it's if you unopened. need to, yeah. and then you open it up. So if you've opened it up, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, got a, yeah. it's kind of gone. That's really interesting. Um, and one of the things that both agents and publishers both hate is having something, a manuscript on their thing, that it, it just really goes to show that you didn't read about the kind of books that they're interested in. Mm. So that goes back mm. to that scattergun approach. Mm. It's research. Mm. So yeah, you go and you kind of look and see, where would I like to see my book be? So even, so even going to bookshops is yeah. research. Yeah. Where do I want to see my book on the shelf? Mm. You know, and that even goes for the cover. When yes. It, comes I, it really kind of upsets me when so many writers are like kind of like they're signing these contracts and they don't like the cover and they don't say they don't like the cover. Yeah. You see, you have to sell your book. They're not going to sell your book. They've mm -hmm. done their bit. They've published it for you. You've got to do. You've got to do all of that work. You know. So you've really got to do your homework about the kind of books that publishers are looking for. I mean, not, it's not guaranteed that you're going to get in there. Like she said, it took her a nine goes. Mm -hmm. You know, before getting anywhere. But they will quickly. It will quickly fall away from their desk if it, if they realise like this person just has done no research. Why are they sending me this fantasy novel when I'm just into memoir? Mm. You know? Mm. And it's wasting your time and money as well, really. Yeah. Mm. That's great advice. Um, I think we've got time for one more. We can, yeah, just up there. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Lucy Zion. I'm a poet, um, and I'm also looking at into writing. My question is about vulnerability. So um, I'm a British-born Bayesian from Brixton. <laughs> um, and... I know we have a very strong culture of not kind of airing <laughs> family business mm -hmm. publicly. Um, but so much of what I write is about upbringing and about family generally mm -hmm. and about emotion. And my question is about how you develop that resilience and that thicker skin of pursuing that writing while dealing with family and culture and I guess them seeing their reflection in your work. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> you came you came you chose violence today, girl. <laughs> um I don't and this is what people don't like to hear. In order for me to live the life that I have lived, I have had to put many people in a grave that are still breathing. You don't exist to me. You can't exist to me because your existence is intruding on my truth. And those two things just don't marry. And you cannot be as vulnerable as you're going to want to be and maintain the relationships that are cancerous to you. So you need to make a really grave decision. I think especially if you're, going, you're planning to write from a non-fiction perspective. This is costly work. And I don't just mean in time and energy. I also mean in generational ties. And no one discusses that. We don't normally have a panel like this for you to discuss that. <coughs> it's heavy, deep work. And are you committed? Is your truth worth that price? Mine was, but that doesn't mean that I don't come off this stage and my heart is heavy in other areas because I can't communicate with certain family members or I can't, I'm estranged in certain ways or I feel orphaned. Is it worth that? In my opinion, making sure that young black girls feel loved by themselves and are encouraged to go where love is, is worth that. But you need to really reckon with um, if telling that truth is worth that loss in the interim. And it is only the interim because you'll pick up that love in other places and it will be a love that blows your head off. That's why I say in Sister Sister, blood ain't always thicker than water, the end. But you need to evaluate because it's such a personal risk. So I can't tell you what to do. I can only tell you what I've done. That's tough. <laughs> I faced the same thing. I was lucky I work for a, a small publishing company, um, and I'm lucky my sister and I are very close. We had discussions about this. Basically, there's a special issue that went to family, <laughs> basically, to get around all of that, because I couldn't see. I thought to myself, I have to tell this story, mm -hmm. because I actually tried leaving it out when I gave it to the publisher. He's like, I sense there's this bit mm -hmm. missing. Mm-hmm. And that bit that was missing was actually almost like the heart mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the book. So what am I doing the book for? You know, so I then had to work a way around getting it out yeah. <laughs> to some and getting it out different to others. But, you know, it's, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a tough decision. But if you're going to be the writer that you want to be, you've, you've got to go for it. it. It's actually changed a lot more now more than you think it has and there are a lot more people actually coming out and, and, and doing that and saying that if it's your first book then it's then obviously it's going to be more difficult and some people might do it two or three books down the line when they've got a little bit more confidence or something like that but as well it's about maybe finding some other writers other women writers other black writers other writers where you can feel comfortable to kind of discuss that as well around what to do um, and, and just and when and just having that support about doing it. Great. So we are going to have to end things there. But just two reminders. Um, again, Candice will be signing copies of her book if you'd like to go down and get those signed. Um, also, her book, Sister, Sister, is available in all good bookstores. So <laughs> if you <laughs> haven't bought it already, pick that up. Um, you will want to keep it for yourself. Then you'll want another copy for the young black women and black black women, black girls, black boys in your lives. So 
buy a few. Um, and then also Khadija's book, This is a Canon, will be coming out in October the 28th, mm-hmm. I want to say. Yes. Um, and again, take that, write down every book that you want to buy, which will be most. And um, <laughs> again, just share. These are books that are made to be shared and Absolutely. these are books that are made to be reread and with you know, corners folded and, Mm -hmm. you know, really make use of them. Um, So if we could just give our lovely panellists a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us. (laughs) And that's all from us this evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.